morning, everyone. Boy, a Monday morning, the snow's coming down a little bit, and you're all here. So aren't you the lucky ones? So I, my name is Jen McCann, and I'm here um, from the University of Rhode Island uh, Graduate School of Oceanography, uh, Coastal Resources Center. And I want to, first of all, thank you all for coming to this event. Um, we really appreciate it, and um, we're looking forward to a lot of interactive discussion today. So uh, a few months ago, uh, Grover Fugate came into my office with that eye going, I need something from you. And I'm like, oh no, not again. <laughs> the last time he did that was with the Ocean Samp, and look what happened there. So um, Grover came in with an idea and also with a concern. The concern was that Grover was attending many meetings down in Washington and Virginia at Boehm and also up in, uh, throughout New England and recognized that there's, you know, we've been doing this Block Island wind farm thing for a while and there's a lot of research going on, whether it be off of our Rhode Island coasts or off of Massachusetts. However, not very many people know about what the results of this research is. And however, these, this type of activity is affecting many of us and all of us in different ways. So the idea is this, was this two-day event, a, an event where we could express and share some of the research that, um, that was coming to light, some of the results. And, uh, and so that's what, where we started. We also recognized that there was a need to um, many of you have been involved in this experiment, experiment, experience, adventure um, of uh, both siting wind farms, operate, operation of wind farms, and, and construction. And so there was a real need to sort of pause, hit the pause button, and understand where we're coming from and, and what have we learned from this experience. Um, Grover approached Bohm, Mary Boatman, and, and Jim Bennett to, to see what they thought of this idea. And, um, and then also Aileen Kenny from Deepwater Wind. And all recognized that this was a, a really important uh, effort to, to ensure that it took place, that we, did, we shared this information with everyone um, so that we were all on the same page. And recognizing again that um, you know, Rhode Island and Massachusetts are, are moving forward on this together in many ways. There's lots of reasons why um, there's a need to cooperate and coordinate initiatives, and, and that's taking place, that Massachusetts really needed to be a part of this day in both the organization of the day and um, the sharing of information. Um, Deepwater Wind, we, we really want to appreciate a Aileen and Jeff for funding this effort. Um, in addition to Rhode Island Sea Grant and VHB. The University of Rhode Island, we're part of this. We've been here for a while um, on this issue, um, both um, developing the research, much of the research that's been taking place, but also to ensure that um, the table is set correctly, okay? That everyone has a seat at the table, that research and science is part of the decision making but also the public has a place in this conversation. Um, and and the, the informed public, as well as those who want to learn about what's going on. So, so that's why we are here. So the next day, the next two days, will be about communicating research. Um, you'll see from the agenda, we have sessions about uh, marine mammals, about birds and bats. We also have um, sessions on the effects um, wind farms may have on communities, as well as um, providing a tribal perspective. So we, we're, we're trying very hard to be as comprehensive as we can in getting um, everyone's um, perspective. The other thing we're, we're focusing on is understanding the process and looking back at the process, how things have happened. What are the tools that were effective and useful and what are the tools that we need to fix and do better at? 
um, what other tools and techniques do we have to implement to make sure that as this new industry is growing off of our shores and along our coastline, we put into place? Every panelist, we, we've asked every panelist to speak briefly about their research, about their experience, to ensure that there's opportunity for everyone to have an opportunity to ask a question or to provide their perspective. So just because you're, you're not on the panel doesn't mean um, you can't speak. We encourage you to um, share your thoughts, ask your questions. So um, just because you're sitting there doesn't, and we chose this auditorium for that reason. It's, it's pretty easy to interact in this, in, this, um, in this auditorium. Another reason thing is each panelist, we're asking them to think about what happened, how, you know, whether it be a researcher, a regulator, a community member, and say, what advice would you give to somebody in your shoes? Okay, so if there's another place, so is it another, if there's another community grappling with this issue, what advice would you give to them? Or another researcher, or another regulator. So, and, and again, as this industry is growing, what advice sh do we need to all take in order to ensure that there's the least amount of impact? Um, I mentioned that the geographic scope, so to speak, for this workshop is southern New England. So we're spending a lot of time talking about the Block Island wind farm because we have research around that specific um, wind farm, as well as southern New England. So really, t these next two days, we're focusing on Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, I, I'm proud to say we have over 170 um, people who registered for this event. Um, ranging from Maine to Virginia, and you represent federal regulators, state regulators, um, people who uh, are participate in the tourism industry, commercial and recreational fishermen, and residents, um, as well as researchers. So we, we have a gamut of people um, who are in the room. We, we're also live casting this event, um, so people who aren't able to travel are, are participating, and also we're recording this event. Um, Sue Kennedy over there in the computer with the nice comfy shoes on is she's summer, she's documenting this day too. So we will be summarizing um, this day, summarizing um, the the results. And also, I'm not sure if you noticed online we've um, upload we're uploading. We've asked every panelist to um, share with us some of their research technical documents or other information that they have found useful and that could help. Um, communicate what they're doing. So um, please go to that resource site as well. Um, lunch, and again, we have a reception uh, later on, and additional restrooms are across the street at the um, Coastal Institute Auditorium, and we also have some poster sessions there as well. So we encourage you to take a look at all that. Um, so we thank you all for coming and engaging, and um, with that, uh, let's begin um, our first session is um, basically about setting the stage. And um, uh, first off is, is Jim Bennett from BOEM. And, and the group has decided to, to sit there to have a, sort of a good informal discussion about um, and to set the stage for this event. So thanks, Jim. OK, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Jim Bennett. I'm the program manager at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for the Offshore Renewables Program. Can everybody hear me OK? Is that work? Good. Um, and I want to thank you, Jennifer, and everyone for in inviting us here today. We're looking forward to talking about the, uh, the research and the information we've collected from Block Island. Uh, although I'm going to talk a little bit more, as, as Jen said, uh, about setting the stage, about the context uh, and the program for offshore wind and what we're looking at over the next several years. Um, appreciate being here uh, to talk with you about the work we're doing at BOEM along with the work that's being done at URI and with deep water wind. Uh, we believe that the Outer Continental Shelf can provide a very significant contribution to the administration's all of the above energy strategy. Uh, and that includes revenue, it includes jobs, it includes energy diversity. We know that in the Northeast, we have the trifecta uh, for wind energy projects. We have a great wind resource. We have a buildable environment, a, a shallow sloping shelf uh, to, that fits with the currently available technology. And we have world-class markets for energy consumption. 
So uh, I want to mention what we've been doing over the last several years. Uh, we have a dozen leases uh, extending from North Carolina to Massachusetts with over 15 gigawatts of capacity here in the Atlantic. That's enough to power over 5 million homes. Um, the leases, as I said, uh, uh, we've had seven competitive lease sales in the last few years, generating $68 million and leasing 1.4 million acres for renewable energy offshore uh, in the Atlantic. As I mentioned, the leases extend from Massachusetts to North Carolina, from Cape Cod to Cape Hatteras. Every state from Massachusetts to North Carolina has at least one uh, federal outer continental shelf renewable energy lease off their off their coast. In addition to that, uh, our work is changing uh, dramatically from focusing exclusively on leasing to focusing on servicing those leases. In June, we uh, approved the site assessment plan for Bay State Wind, and in October, we approved two more site assessment plans for Dominion Energy and for deep water wind up here in Rhode Island. Next year, we expect uh, four or five construction and operations plans. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we actually start working towards uh, put, uh, installing uh, wind farms offshore. And we anticipate that the, uh, uh, we'll have steel, steel in federal waters by 2020 with the uh, Dominion Research uh, uh, lease in Virginia. Um, upcoming activities. BOEM is assessing a path forward for additional leasing, uh, and we want your input on that. A request for feedback will be coming out very shortly, uh, and uh, we're, we, we need to know from everybody where we think additional leasing should occur. We're addressing that in New York right now. Uh, we have unsolicited offshore uh, uh, requests in New York and for the two unleased areas off of Massachusetts. Uh, we anticipate a proposed sale notice for, Mass for those areas off of Massachusetts very soon, early next year, and we're working with New York on their master planning activities uh, to uh, pursue 2.4 gigawatts of offshore energy uh, in the next uh, several years. Um, the call for information and nominations will be uh, out very soon in the new year. All of this uh, occurs or does not occur uh, as, as a result, to my mind, of state leadership and contributions. And we have on the panel here uh, uh, national leaders as far as uh, uh, state activities are concerned. Massachusetts with a call for 1.6 gigawatts. New York with a master plan goal of 2.4 gigawatts. Uh, that's why things are happening up here, of course, in addition to the first deal in the water, which was Block, uh, Block Island. But that's why things are happening up here is because the states are involved and in a very positive way. We have a lot of challenges, military and navigation. We're going to talk about these over the, over the course of the next two days. Uh, fisheries, visual effects. Uh, we have some really uh, important challenges with regard to stakeholder in, uh, in involvement. Uh, and making sure that we have a pipeline of opportunities for leasing over the next several years. Grid readiness and supply chain are also uh, issues that need to be addressed. So with that, uh, we're very optimistic that a lot of activities uh, and, and steel in the water are going to occur in just a, just a few years from now, and it's going to be a very different environment in the Atlantic as far as renewable energy is concerned. Block Island has led the way. Uh, we on the federal side are looking forward uh, to, uh, uh, to continuing that effort, but we're not going to be able to do it without uh, very, very good scientific information upon which to base our decisions. Uh, and so we're very much looking forward to working with you today on what has been done and helping to identify what still needs to be done uh, to move forward with offshore wind. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, while it may seem that this is a relatively recent thing, uh, offshore wind happening in, in this environment, we actually got involved back in 2007. So we've been at this for a decade now. Um, 
We have one of our council members, Don Gomez. Don, you wanna raise your hand? Don's been here from the start with the development of the ocean SAMP and also through the permitting hearings for the Block Island Wind Farm. Over the next two days, you're gonna hear a lot of science. Uh, and in my mind, it sort of falls in three buckets. Uh, the first has to deal with siting. So you're trying to study the system to understand what are the resources. So where are the birds, where are the fish, uh, where are the marine mammals, turtles, and so on. Understanding how they utilize the system, where they utilize that system, uh, for what purposes. So understanding that system is very important in the, in the siting uh, aspect as, as you go <laughs> forward. You also have to understand who uses that area. Um, how they use it, when they use it, for what. Uh, those types of things are all part of understanding our, this process so that you can try to figure out where's the best place to, to put a wind farm because with renewable energy, we often have a lot of alternatives in different siting uh, areas, but there's siting constraints, obviously, that go along with that. So choosing the right site becomes important, but I think here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we're sort of focusing on the other two buckets as I see it. So once you've chosen a site, the next question is, how do you develop that site so you do the least amount of damage and those structures survive in some very harsh environments going into the future? So how do you construct those sites? Um, and so a lot of science tends to focus on how can we minimize the impacts for the locations that we've just chosen. The third bucket tends to fall into, okay, we built one of these. Uh, what is actually happening? What's happening to the resources? What's happening to the users? How are these systems performing in those environments to understand that so that we can move forward and learn from that? That's the adaptive management side. Um, so that we can apply that knowledge to future wind farms so that we reduce those impacts further and further down the line. The science that we are focusing in on, and I think part of the process today, was to learn what we could from the Block Island Project, as well as the other studies that we have conducted. The Block Island Project, while it is a, in some minds, a, a relatively small scale venture, it does provide a very good learning opportunity to see what those impacts are and learn some of the construction issues associated with that. I think if you were to ask Deepwater, uh, they learned a lot of valuable lessons in constructing the Block Island wind farm that will be very helpful going forward into the future. Uh, just to give you an example of some of the potential impacts, uh, there were two acoustic hammers that were used uh, during the pile driving, for example. There were very different acoustic signals that were sent out for those two hammers. And therefore, one tends to be the more preferred method of constructing and driving those piles to reduce the impact. Those are some of the things that we learned and I think are helpful to future developments going forward. Do we know all the answers? No, we don't. Um, and the science that we tend to, to shoot for we look for trying to get to absolutely certain on these issues, but we don't obviously approach that. What we try to get to as managers is reasonable certainty that the uh, projects that we've just constructed and the projects that are in play will cause the least amount of impact to the system while providing the most benefit. That's what we're here to discuss today. So I would encourage you to listen today, think about what's being said, and also provide input as to what you think we need to look at in the future. There's still a lot to be done. We've learned a lot, but there's still a lot that needs to be done, and I think that's the uh, part that we would like to hear from you today. So thank you. Thank you, Grover. Uh, my name is Bill White. I am the Senior Director of Offshore Wind Sector Development at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Um, I am surrounded by Rhode Island. I got the coastal here, I got the energy here, I got the nation's first offshore wind developer in front of me. I think it's all to make sure I'm well behaved today, so they've got me surrounded. 
You know, once upon a time, we thought maybe we would, Massachusetts would be able to talk about our first offshore wind project. Um, and, you know, right now, probably after a first year of operation. But as you all know, that, uh, that saga has ended and uh, that project um, is not moving forward. Uh, but we did learn a lot from it. And, um, you know, for, for, from Massachusetts, thinking about kind of the path forward, I wanted to kind of maybe um, go a little bit bigger picture uh, than Grover and um, just talk about kind of why, why it is that we're, we're focused on this resource. It's not to drive all you crazy. Uh, it's not to cause aggravation for commercial fishermen. Um, it's not to, you know, impact, um, you know, marine mammals. It really is not. It's, it's really a, um, a mandate on a number of levels. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anybody in this room that is not kind of... Um, Kind of aware of the of of what probably is our our greatest challenge as a species, and that is climate change. Uh, there's not a peer-reviewed study that contradicts what is happening right now uh, to our atmosphere. I don't know if anybody saw Governor Jerry Brown last night uh, in the fires of uh, of uh, California. You know the the most significant wildfires the state has ever seen in its history. And, um, and, and what it's attributable to. So there's a, um, as, as coastal states, as Rhode Island and Massachusetts, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, at the center of, of climate change also, uh, and thinking about those impacts and thinking about what those impacts will be for this generation as well as next. Massachusetts has a commitment to drive down uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are contributing to climate change. Uh, some of the most aggressive uh, goals in the country, including a commitment to drive down GHG emissions below 1990 levels uh, by 80% by 2050. And guess what? We need to have offshore wind as part of that mix in order to re reach that goal. Um, we in this region also, not, not just Massachusetts, but in the ISO, the New England region, are dealing with an enormous amount of uh, old energy generation whether it's nuclear or coal, those, those genera generators are retiring. We need to replace them. Uh, Massachusetts uh, is thinking about how to do that and has actually been pa has passed legislation in order to bring on more hydro into the region, mostly up from, from down from Canada, uh, and also to make a significant commitment to offshore wind. It is a uh, significant resource just off our coast. Um, it is uh, the winds in this area are as strong uh, as in any area of the North Sea, uh, we've been actually doing some wind measurement on that subject. And so this legislation that was passed uh, and signed by Governor Baker last, uh, last fall is really kind of to kind of kick off a competitive solicitation among um, qualified developers looking to move this, this, this process forward and build, and build clean energy projects. Uh, Bru I mean, excuse me, Jim earlier talked about the federal kind of piece of this. And the state piece of this is really the energy procurement. But we also are going beyond that. We're, we're thinking about, again, how to minimize these impacts. As everyone, I think, on this panel and in this room knows, there's no energy resource that does not have impacts. And, you know, some of us like to think offshore wind is, is better than other resources. And I think, obviously, it has its attributes. But the impacts of, of to fishing uh, have to be have to be examined. The impacts to marine mammals have to be examined and have to be minimized and have to be avoided. And I, again, I congratulate uh, the deep water team and the state of Rhode Island for for moving forward the first offshore wind project so we can begin to learn uh, l l learn the lessons of of offshore wind and learn how to do it right. Um, I'll just uh, close by just talking about you know like uh, the state of Rhode Island, we have also been thinking hard about how to prepare for this moment. And we have spent an awful lot of time and resources thinking about, um, you know, not only, well, first, let me just start with stakeholder engagement. We have taken this, this issue very, very seriously. We have, uh, you know, Bruce and I have led over 100 stakeholder meetings across our uh, Commonwealth. Uh, we have been down into the communities we have kind of formed what we call the fisheries working group, uh, representing all sectors and all ports and all gear types across Massachusetts to really kind of get get an, a, a better, deeper understanding and appreciation of those of those um, of those issues. It is really the fisheries working group and the recommendations from those uh, fishermen at our table that have really led to the reductions of the areas and the refinement of our offshore wind planting areas on the other side of the vineyard. Um, as, uh, as you all probably are familiar with on the map. 
Um, but we've also been also invested in you know environmental characterization. We're working with the New England Aquarium. We're working with um, you know other NGOs in order to basically uh, establish the baseline data. We've got overflights happening. We've got underwater acoustic buoys. Again, to understand the resource, to gather the baseline data, so that when BOEM is making its uh, its decisions, it can be informed by the science. So I will just. Um, I will just say that um, you know, having the opportunity to learn from an actual offshore wind project in the United States um, is, is a great benefit. You know, I'm thinking about Mary Boatman and the rodeo program um, and how all of this research can, be, can lead to lessons learned for all of us. Um, we will try to uh, you know, do our best to understand. We'll do our best today to uh, have our teams available to engage. Uh, Bruce Carlisle, Nils Bolgan, and Tyler Studs, uh, all from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, are here. Uh, Catherine Ford is here uh, from our Division of Marine Fisheries. So we're here to engage and listen and learn. But um, you know, offshore wind is coming. We need to make sure we work together to minimize impacts as best we can. Thanks very much. Well, it's a hard act to follow. Good morning. I am Carol Grant. I'm the Commissioner of the Office of Energy Resources for Rhode Island. And it's a position I've held since June of 2016. So unlike my colleague Grover, I have uh, viewed this development of Rhode Island's offshore wind project and leadership from a very different vantage point. Uh, so I was delighted to get the question framed the way it was. Uh, when I arrived, the excitement of the construction of Block Island was palpable. The jobs that had been promised were real. People were actually actively engaging in, in the ports of Rhode Island and were realizing that this dream that we had talked about, I had worked in Boston in, in the renewable um, energy industry for the whole time that we talked about maybe, maybe Massachusetts would be first, but I live in Rhode Island, so I have to say that I was just tremendously excited to see the reality um, coming to be. What happened as that was going on was in the first few months um, that I was working with Governor Raimondo, she asked me the question that has come up here because all of a sudden with the reality of, oh my gosh, the U.S. is going to finally build an offshore wind project, people from all over the globe started descending on Rhode Island. It was great. It's wonderful to have them here in our hotels talking to each other, but also asking the question that's asked here, what advice do we have? It's happening, it's thrilling, we wanna see it grow, we understand that New York and Massachusetts and other neighbors are going to now pick up on this in exactly the way we had hoped, what advice do we have? So having not been here from the first, I had the advantage of coming in later and watching and wondering and trying to figure out how through three different governors of different parties, Rhode Island had kept this project alive and moving, moving toward completion. And I concluded, and the governor has concluded, there are three pieces of wisdom that we garner from the fact that, that it is spinning and has been for a year. One is that the process was based on facts. Uh, it is not, not really popular these days to have actual facts. These are real facts. Um, and I think that the research, the uh, the solid basis of facts that came both from the developer but also from URI and from other places were critical to the ability to make decisions that are complex decisions about the siting of the first wind farm and about each wind farm. These, these are important, important siting decisions and having them be fact-based was critical to the success. Second is, frankly, collaboration at all levels. <clears throat> the, it's hard to say which is the most important collaboration that led to the success of Block Island, but I would certainly start with the stakeholders, the people of Block Island, the fisheries industry, the people who were affected by it onshore with the cable landings that, that needed to be sited onshore, all of the people who were concerned about the effects of it. So the engagement with stakeholders was one piece of collaboration. The other was, and I can say this because I wasn't here, the collaboration across agencies in Rhode Island and between Rhode Island and federal agencies was, was constant, was 
creative, was productive, and was focused on getting to outcomes, not on building turf or you know who was the most right. So I give a lot of credit to the people who came before me on the policy side and Grover's side in DEM. A lot of people collaborated to figure out what's the best answer. And, and frankly, importantly, I think we also learned about collaboration with other states. As we were talking with global participants in the offshore industry, one of the, the head scratchers for many of them was, what is this with state borders, like, and different policies, and different, um, you know, different agencies in each. They look at a market in the Northeast United States, and they see a market. Um, they understand that there are differences, but I think that to the extent that we have been able to demonstrate, and certainly between Bill's shop and ours, but also other states in the, the uh, Eastern Seaboard, the willingness to collaborate and to figure out these important issues together has been a, a success of Block Island and will be a success going forward. I have no doubt about that. Um, and finally, just the focus of making sure that everybody involved made decisions. These are complex issues. It's hard to get, as Grover said, to perfection or to 99% certainty, but to work with the best facts available and then to be committed to making decisions um, and to sorting out and balancing all the different needs. I think those are the three things that we learned um, and that those would be my advice for others. Now finally, I would say this is not entirely a phil philanthropic endeavor by Rhode Island. We love giving advice, don't get me wrong. We're happy to give advice. Um, and we are frankly happy to share what we've learned. I think that, that continuous learning, the continuous effort to improve will lead to a great industry. But we're also very interested because as you probably know, Governor Raimondo has charged us in, in our offices with adding 1,000 megawatts of clean energy very, on a very accelerated basis. That will undoubtedly, at best, include all forms of clean energy. And in order to explore the possibility of offshore wind, we have actually collaborated with the Massachusetts procurement, um, both for the, re the hydro and onshore renewables, but also with the offshore. So we hope that it's not, this is not going to be the last participation that Rhode Island has in procuring offshore wind. We're very excited about it. We're glad to be here today. Thank you for all your input. Thank you. <laughs> hold on, hold on. So um, the way we're gonna do Q&A here is um, if you could speak, if you have a question, um, if you could speak loud and clear and either I or one of the panelists will repeat the question. So um, does anyone have any questions? Jack? So we're going to repeat the question. So, so Bill, go ahead. All right. Do I have to? No. So my friend Jack Clark uh, from Mass Audubon has asked, uh, what are the lessons learned from the Cape Wind Project? Jack's objective here is to try to get me fired. Um, <laughs> but actually, it's a fair question. It's a good question. And there's obviously a lot of buzz about you know, this, this moment. I, I guess the first thing I, I will say is that um, you know, the news of last week that Cape Wind is withdrawing its lease from uh, Nantucket Sound is not a surprise. I mean, for, for, for really since the end of 2014, when uh, Cape Wind was not able to uh, lock down its financing and then the utilities uh, soon thereafter withdrew their PPAs, their power purchase agreements. This is, you know, th this is something that we've known for a long time, but it, again, it, it maybe gives some finality to it. But, um, I, I don't know. I mean, what, what I think about is, um, you know, how Cape Wind helped Massachusetts be where we are today. I mean, that's what I focus on. I try to f focus on, you know, without Cape Wind, I mean, Cape Wind in a way served as a, as a catalyst, not just for Massachusetts, but I would say for the entire uh, East Coast in educating us onto the possibility of Cape Wind, uh, excuse me, of offshore wind. So it kind of 
really educated us. It was really the reason that I got involved in state government was because of this opportunity, this opportunity to, to build a, 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 a zero emissions resource on a, on a, in an area that has an enormous amount of uh, power. The wind is free, of course, um, to produce zero emissions, to create jobs locally. I mean, there was a lot of there's a, there was a lot that we learned uh, from Cape Wind and how it captured, I think, and educated uh, the people of Massachusetts. It did not go forward, but you know, I think it was because of Cape Wind that you know we thought about uh, offshore wind round two. We thought it's really going to be round one because round round one never happens. So round two is really further offshore uh, in the areas south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, we did uh, a lot of environmental characterization up front in order to accelerate the permitting process, which is lengthy, as we all know. Uh, so that was another lesson learned. I think the investment in infrastructure that the Commonwealth made uh, was really made as, you know, Cape Wind being the catalyst for those, th those investments. And I think, you know, I'm talking about the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal, which all three developers uh, for, let's say, this upcoming round have committed to utilize as a uh, staging port. Um, you know, it, these are the, and, and the transmission planning that we've undertaken. I think those are the lessons learned uh, of the Cape Wind project. I mean, on a personal level, I w I'm disappointed to see it fail, but I think, you know, in the end, I think it did pave the pathway for uh, the future procurement and all the work that the Commonwealth has done in order to make this industry a success. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Dave Monty, one more question, and then we're going to move on to the next session. Jim, this is a question for you. Renewable energy in this country, how is it fair and uh, like with other sources of uh, energy in the country? Is it a good, fair future? Uh, uh, I, I'm not an expert on that across the nation, but I think it is faring very well. But I think the, the, the most important thing is the way the, uh, the renewable energy offshore, the wind energy offshore, has turned around in the last couple of years. In particular, uh, the way uh, Statoil uh, has, has definitely uh, displayed industry interest, along with the other people who were, uh, other companies that were involved in that auction, also in North Carolina, uh, and uh, the North Carolina sale that went for considerably more than we expected. Uh, I think we've turned a corner on, on wind energy, and, and, it, and that corner is here in the northeast of the United States, and I think the, the, the prospects are very, very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Jeff Grabowski from Deepwater Wind, the CEO from Deepwater Wind, who's going to um, provide us what he's learned and what Deepwater Wind has learned. Jeff? Thank you, Jen. Um, my name is Jeff Grabowski. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Deepwater Wind, and um, it's special uh, to be here in this particular location. Um, this room, frankly, is a very special place for the Block Island Wind Farm. Um, folks who participated in that process know that uh, we held con countless hearings uh, with the CRMC in this very location uh, as the state went through its very extensive process to review the suitability of the Block Island Wind Farm under the Ocean SAM. Uh, and the Ocean SAM subcommittee sat here for many, many hours uh, and listened uh, to testimony from Deepwater and from other stakeholders. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty interesting to be right here. And, and meeting folks today, it's a bit like uh, uh, high school reunion for offshore wind geeks today. And we're running into a lot of people who have participated in this process over the years. Um, even Bill White from Massachusetts, I know, was rooting for us the whole time. But there are a lot of folks here who played really important roles uh, in the development of the Block Island Wind Farm. And in that role often had to do with this intersection with science. So I, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about how we got here, um, where we're headed, and how I think science can help. And, and perhaps, um, perhaps what I have to say on that is uh, not what you might expect. Um, first of all, let's talk about how we got here. The Block Island Wind Farm 
was conceived in 2008. Um, that's when the first developer concept happened. Uh, and at that time, the Block Island Wind Farm was not the foremost offshore wind proposal in the United States. It was, frankly, something of an afterthought in the industry. Um, many others uh, were proposing to build offshore wind. Uh, there was a project in Massachusetts, the Cape Wind Project, was well over 400 megawatts. There was a 300 plus megawatt project off the coast of Delaware uh, being proposed by a company named Blue Water Wind. There was uh, a series of proposals being pushed off the coast of New Jersey, uh, and there was a just recently failed proposal off the coast of Long Island by Florida Power and Light, which was all another 400 megawatt project. So there were many, many projects with quite large ambitions uh, about offshore wind in the United States. And then along comes the proposal for the deep water wind project. 30 megawatts, five turbines, yawn. <laughs> Europeans were building hundreds upon hundreds of megawatts. And, and why did we start with 30? Well, when everyone else was building so much more. Well, the first reason is that the state had done a whole lot of thinking about this for many years. And those other projects I mentioned were completely developer driven. They were in essence drawn up on a whiteboard in a developer's office. They were engineered. An engineer said, I can build this much in this area. They were mechanically engineered and financially engineered to be those particular project sizes. And those projects failed. And that's one of my themes, that it's not about the engineering. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Rhode Island looked at things very differently. The CRMC decided to do a special area management plan for their ocean zone. And Grover Fugate and his team worked many, many years pulling together stakeholders and doing baseline scientific data gathering. And, and the result was a plan that the state then went to the world with and said, we think these, are, these places on this map are the best places for offshore wind. So please, developer, give us a wind farm that fits in what we and what the community is willing to accept. And so we started with the Block Island Wind Farm, which was originally designed to be eight megawatts, uh, eight, eight turbines times 3.6 megawatt machines. Now, one of the initial things that happened internally uh, back in the day which may have sent us the same way as the Cape Wind and Florida Power Light and, and all those other projects that didn't come across the finish line, is that someone had a bright idea that perhaps we could put 100 turbines around Block Island. That was really the right way to go, since that had been zoned for offshore wind. And, um, and folks intervened and said, maybe we should start a little smaller, even though we could fit 100. I'm looking at Kim Gaffett here from Block Island, who's the first warden. Uh, on Block Island, and, and, and I know Kim, um, Kim would have, she probably wouldn't be here today if we'd been um, pursuing 100 turbines around Block Island. So that process of interaction with the state and the community and the stakeholders was really important for us to get to a project size that could be successful. Um, the Block Island project eventually, eight years later, came into commercial operation. And from our perspective, there are a number of, of lessons that we draw from for why the Block Island was, project was successful while others weren't. Starting small is important in, in many lines of business. When you're doing something new, when you're doing something for the first time, um, going for the largest size isn't necessarily the right way to go. Even though it may make financial sense, and from an engineering perspective, building 400 megawatts of offshore wind is it's very achievable, it's something that's done essentially literally every day now. Uh, but starting small makes a lot of sense when you step back and you look at the long term. Because as someone on the panel said, I think it was Bill, uh, offshore wind does have impacts. There are really are impacts from offshore wind. Uh, and it's important to proceed uh, in a way that allows you to measure those impacts and understand them before you get to the point where your impacts are so large that you've done lasting damage to your cause. So starting small was important. Uh, it also financially and from a commercial perspective is important. 
Um, small projects can have really big problems, but if it's a small project, you probably can fix it. If you have a really big project, sometimes even small problems on really big projects cause that project um, to not proceed. So starting small was really important because this was so new. Um, we also had a project driven by what the state was looking for that had a practical solution, it, that presented a solution to a real world problem. This, again, this wasn't a project that was drawn up on the map in a developer's office. There really was a problem on Block Island. Block Island received all of its energy from diesel power. Block Island was not electrically connected to the mainland. There really was a problem there that had to be solved. And islanders have been trying to solve this problem of having really old, really dirty, really expensive, really unstable power supply on the island for decades. They've been trying to solve this forever. So the Block Island wind farm not only um, produced a new source of energy for the island, but allowed the island to be electrically connected to the mainland so that Block Island now is part of the New England electric grid. That was a real world solid, that was a real problem that Block, the Block Island Wind Farm addressed. Consequently, we had a reservoir of support on Block Island that other projects that were just thrown on a map somewhere off the coast simply didn't have in a local community. And so addressing real world problems with these projects, again, real world problems, not, not, it's not about the engineering, what you can do theoretically, what practically can you and should you do? Uh, this is something that Block Island helped address. Uh, and we also realized that given the fact that a project, even a small one, like the Block Island Wind Farm, will have impacts, we made a decision very early on to, as best we could, become members of this broader community and become partners with that community. And being a member and a partner of a community means not just um, trying to convince everyone that your way is the only way to do it, but it means making concessions. And it means sometimes it's not about the engineering. Sometimes it's about moving forward, muddling your way forward, making the right concessions for both the community and the project that maximizes everyone's goals at the end of the day the best you can. And so we, we had to work with lots of folks in the community. And obviously the folks on Block Island um, uh, were really important. And we, for instance, to reduce the visual impact, reduced the project from eight turbines to five turbines. We provided the community with blo of Block Island with, um, with access to a fiber optic cable that would allow the islanders to, for the first time ever, have high-speed in internet. We worked very, very closely with the island in uh, coordinating construction on their beach. And in that partnership with the island, the give and take with the island was really important uh, for the long-term success of the Block Island Wind Farm. Um, we also worked with other stakeholders like commercial fishermen, and, and I know that, that a number of them are here today, Lanny Dellinger and Chris Brown and Bill McElroy were all, are all local commercial fishermen who you know, went out on a limb a little bit um, for even talking to a developer. Uh, and they worked with us and spent a lot of time to really try to understand where we were coming from. And we did our best to work with them uh, so that we could explain to them what we were trying to accomplish. And that kind of collaboration with, uh, with competing uses of the ocean uh, was really important. It's something that the SAMP uh, process encouraged, but I like to think that we took it a few steps beyond what was required of us. Uh, and, and we eventually uh, worked out a number of, I think, creative solutions and opportunities to, to learn more about how offshore wind and fishing can work together. And all of that is, you know, this is not, um, it's, it's enlightened self-interest perhaps the best way to put it. Um, I don't often get to speak to a room full of scientists. I'm certainly not one. 
uh, I'm a pragmatist, and I understand that uh, these uh, concessions and these relationships that we've built over the years are important not just for the Block Island project, but for the long-term vision. Uh, and it was always important to talk about the long-term vision as w uh, while we were talking about this relatively small project. Uh, people want to know that they're part of something that could have really large implications and have a really long-term positive impact on our society. And that often made the conversation about conflicts easier to deal with. Uh, because it isn't just about building one wind farm. Uh, it's about something much larger than that. Uh, and that leads into sort of my second point here, where are we headed? Um, yes, we're going to build a lot of offshore wind in the Northeast United States, as, as Jim mentioned. But there was a question that was a bit broader about where renewable energy is, and, and that's really important to this conversation. Uh, we are, and we don't feel it every day, but if you stop, step back, you'll realize it. We as a society really are in the middle of an energy revolution. It's, it's extraordinary what's happening right now. Um, a change like this hasn't occurred for over 100 years, where the traditional sources of energy that we've relied on for the entire 20th century are slowly but surely dying away. And we can see this change happening um, across the globe, um, but it is surely happening right here in, in southern New England. The largest power plant in southern New England retired just a handful of months ago. The Brayton Point power plant, 1,500 megawatts of coal in Somerset, Massachusetts, shut down gone forever, never going to power, generate power again. And, and I'll give you just a few statistics to drive the point home. Over the last two years in the United States, to, uh, last two complete years, 2015, uh, two-thirds of all the new power plants built, two-thirds of all the new capacity <coughs> built in the United States for power came from renewable sources. Okay. 8,000 megawatts of wind were built, this is 2015. 2,000 megawatts of solar, 15 megawatts of oil, okay? 8,000 megawatts of wind, 15, not 1,000, 15, one, five megawatts of new oil capacity, and three megawatts of new coal capacity built in the United States. That was 2015. So 8,000 versus three. 2016, 9,500 megawatts of solar, 6,800 megawatts of wind and zero megawatts of coal. So the last two full, two full calendar years, we saw an enormous expansion of the capacity base of wind and solar and no, essentially no new growth of coal, oil, fired power. And if we look at which power plants have actually come offline, like Brayton Point in Massachusetts, we will see a huge decrease in the amount of coal generation and, and liquid fuel generation in the United States. Now, we have a lot of natural gas that's also being built. And so if we take, in 2016, natural gas, wind, and solar, that's well over 90% of everything we built in the United States in 2016, new stuff. Um, why is, what's happening? Well, someone mentioned that um, we're seeing something ha called the replacement cycle happen in, in power generation in the US. Much of the big power plants that we have in the United States today were built in the 60s and the 70s and 80s and power plants have a natural life. And at some point they go away because they're too old to fix. And as those power plants retire, they have to be replaced by something. Um, and, and increasingly, the choice that's being made is wind, solar, and gas. Take, for instance, nuclear power. We built almost all of our nuclear power plants in the United States between the 70s and the 90s. Um, in between 1996 and 2015, we built zero new nuclear capacity in the United States. 
2016, we built the first new nuclear uh, power unit in the United States since the mid-90s. And it's very unlikely that we're going to see significant new nuclear capacity built in the U.S. It's very unlikely we're going to see much coal capacity built in the U.S. And we are going to see a lot of natural gas capacity, but the electric system really isn't designed for a single fuel source to be um, the dominant source for very long. Um, fuel diversity is important, uh, both from an energy security standpoint, uh, but from the perspective of balancing the grid and having a healthy electric system. And, and so this very natural thing that's happening in, I'd say on the commercial side of the power business, old plants are going away, they have to be replaced with something, Increasingly, they're being replaced by renewables. That's happening, regardless of the science, regardless of climate change, regardless of state and local or federal policies. That's a fact of life, and it's happening across the globe. If we layer into that the next big things that are happening, we'll, we, we, are, we are going to see a further acceleration of the build, building of renewables, batteries and the electrification of our transportation sector are huge drivers that are just now, they're right under the surface, but they're really starting to cause uh, people in the power business to think very differently about how we generate new sources of energy. The cost of battery storage is, at a utility scale has, con has gone down by a third in the last 12 months. And if we look at it over the last five years, the costs have come down something like 80%. And so the same uh, acceleration that we've seen in the growth of renewable energy, wind and solar, over the last 10 years, we're just about to see that happen in battery storage in the next few years. We're in the middle of it right now. Electrification of the transportation center uh, is largely driving that growth of batteries, battery technology, uh, and the reduction of cost of batteries. Uh, but the combination of the two, electric vehicles and batteries, will cause the demand for renewable energy to skyrocket. And so in this part of the world, where we're sitting today, we're not likely to see huge onshore wind farms. And we simply don't have the solar resource or the acreage on land to build very significant amounts of solar energy. Certainly not enough to make up for something like the Brayton Point power plant and its 1,500 megawatts of around-the-clock generation. But we do have offshore wind. Uh, and offshore wind is easily the biggest domestic source of power that the northeastern part of the United States has. It's, it's not even close. Uh, we have gigawatt upon gigawatt of capacity offshore close to the coastline that can be easily plugged into these large uh, population centers that are clustered along, along the coast. So I'm extraordinarily bullish on the future of renewables and the future that offshore wind plays in that larger renewable sector. And so there are a few things that I, I would ask of, of the folks gathered here today and, and how can science play a role. You know, we at Deepwater have been committed to using the best available science for a long time. Uh, and my colleague Aileen Kenny, who heads up our, our permitting and environmental programs and, and is uh, our chief scientist, uh, has uh, hammered home from day one the importance from our perspective of working with those in the science community. Folks here at URI uh, have played important roles throughout the development of Block Island Wind Farm, and I know that they're very much engaged in this ongoing conversation about how to scale up offshore wind and, and measure its impacts and find the best ways to site and build offshore wind. But Aileen has really hammered home the importance of, of, of being partners with those uh, in the broader community who are interested in the science of offshore wind uh, and using the best available data. And, and Where I, where, where I often um, get frustrated sometimes, uh, I think it was Grover who said uh, on the panel, it's not about absolute certainty, it's about reasonable certainty in the science, science. And so what I ask of the scientific community is be engaged 
not just in the science, but in the broader conversation. I think if there's a criticism that people in this world, in the scientific community, have, have been feeling recently, is on the climate change issue. In that often folks in the scientific community, they create a lot of data and they put their studies out there and they did not engage. They didn't really engage in that public conversation. And when there was pushback, fake news on the other side, the science community, they were comfortable kind of putting their studies together. They weren't really comfortable in engaging in a real way out with, with people on the other side in the community. And so I'd ask you to do that. And I'll give you a real world example. In the early spring in Rhode Island, a humpback whale carcass washed ashore on Jamestown is an island just to our east. And um, a local newspaper interviewed some person who identified himself as an expert in marine mammals without a whole lot of sort of, uh, I would say, the, the, the journalistic standards here were not high. Um, that's another story. But this so-called marine mammal expert speculated that the cause of that a humpback whale's death was quite possibly the Block Island wind farm. That somehow the ultrasonic acoustic waves were, were making their way through the water columns and, uh, and impacting the ability of this whale to go about its business and cause this death. Well, I saw this news story when it hit a newspaper, not in Jamestown, but about an hour and a half later in something called the Daily Caller, which is an online uh, um, publication based in DC with an enormous following, with a really extraordinary headline about wind farm causes whale death. So needless to say, my, my inbox just blew up. And it took me about, and of course, Aileen's first person I called. What the heck is going on? Um, it, and then I spent the next hour online looking at this. And I came pretty, pretty quickly to the data issued by NOAA about this enormous um, incidence of, of unexplained mortalities um, with um, humpback whales and right whales over the last few years. Seen, we've seen up and down the Atlantic seaboard, humpbacks in particular, uh, a far larger um, uh, mortality rate than experienced previously. And so NOAA had previously identified this as, as a real issue. Uh, it clearly wasn't something related to the Block Island wind farm, but it didn't stop people from saying uh, well, that it was the wind farm. And, and to their credit, CRMC and, and BOEM both put information, fact-based information, up on their website about uh, what was happening with whales. But when that sort of thing happens, it would be really great to have some researchers who were willing to step up and actually get engaged in that conversation and provide facts and help people make clear, clear judgments about what is and was, what isn't happening. Because that's what we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, as a developer. Uh, it's very, very hard to counter uh, some, of, some of what we see out there, uh, and it would be a whole lot easier with the participation of folks uh, like, like those who are gathered here today. So I, I just wanted, uh, I'm happy to take some questions from folks. I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, in addition to some of the folks I mentioned, Jim Barrett, Bennett, and Mary Boatman from Boehm have been very supportive of the science program at Boehm, and that's, that's really important to us all. Um, Don Gomez from the OSAMP subcommittee uh, sat through countless, countless hearings and helped us build the Block Island Wind Farm. Catherine Bowes is here, National Wildlife Federation, and Scott Krause from the New England Aquarium, I believe. Uh, and Kim Gafford, I've mentioned a few times, really important. Um, um, leader on Block Island uh, throughout this whole process, and it goes without saying that none of us would be here today without Grover Fugate's foresight and leadership in pushing uh, the SAMP process and getting, getting this community through a first-of-its-kind project. So thank you all, and I'm happy to take any questions, Jen.
Sure. Well, let, let me take those two questions. Um, so, with respect, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, the question was: uh, How does the Block Island wind? How how has the Block Island wind farm impacted the price of power on Block Island? And, and a similar question for how a larger development might impact mainland pricing. Um, with respect to Block Island, uh, clearly prices have decreased on Block Island, and that's principally because Block Island is now a participant in the mainland uh, electric grid. And that, um, that has allowed the island to tap into power pricing that the rest of us um, are, are pay every day. Uh, and so we have a more stable pricing on Block Island, a lower price on Block Island, and I think the security of being part of the larger electric grid. And those were all important things uh, to folks on Block Island. Interestingly, one of the impacts of the Block Island project that I that's uh, uh, failed to mention that, that I didn't realize until I went out there. On May 1st, they decommissioned the diesel generators on Block Island for the first time in 75 years. And a number of folks on Block Island said the most dramatic thing they noticed was suddenly it was quiet for the first time in generations because those di that diesel generator wasn't humming 24-7. And then with respect to offshore wind uh, uh, writ large here in the Northeast, we expect utility scale projects uh, to be extremely cost competitive with the other choices we have building other types of new power plants. So I think it, um, we're going to see large scale offshore wind built. It's going to be at very competitive pricing and it's going to help us all not just meet our carbon reduction goals, but come to a place where we have a secure, uh, cost effective source of energy going forward. Yeah, so uh, as of today, and this is uh, something that is uh, happening live as we, as we sit here today, folks in D.C. are talking about um, uh, the large tax bill, which is the legislative vehicle to address these things. Uh, as of today, really, it's, nothing is changing, um, at least depending on which version of the tax bill you look at. Uh, the version that was passed by the U.S. Senate preserves uh, the existing incentives for wind and solar. So um, I'm quite hopeful that that is the version that will pass, in which case it's no real change to our industry. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Thank you, everyone. So we'll bring our next panel down, um, moderated by uh, Tyler Studs. If you, if you talk into the microphone, it, it won't do that weird sound. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tyler Studs. I'm the senior manager of offshore wind sector development at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And it's uh, my pleasure to moderate this panel this morning, which is going to take a deeper dive into 
what is actually driving the science uh, that's being done uh, regarding offshore wind. And our panelists this morning, as you'll hear, uh, this panel could very easily be called who's driving the science because um, each of them has played a very unique role uh, in conducting and driving the science that you'll be hearing about over these next two days. Um, so we have Mary Boatman from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, Aileen Kenny from Deepwater Wind, Grover Fugate from Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council, and Bruce Carlisle from the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. So um, we're going to hear from each of them, a brief introduction, and we're going to talk about uh, not only what's being done, but really why it's being done, how it's being used, and really get into some of these effective structures of how this research has been conducted and, and will continue to be conducted going forward. Uh, so with that, we'll give it to Mary to start off. Well, thank you, Tyler. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. And uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Again, I'm Mary Boatman with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and I'm the science coordinator in the Office of Renewable Energy Programs um, for the Atlantic. And first of all, I do want to thank Jen McCann and all of her team for putting this together. I know how much work goes into it and really appreciate all their efforts in organizing this event. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to, to hear all of this great research that's been done, some of which has been obviously funded by BOEM, and this is only some of the studies that we've done. We really don't have time to go into everything because some of us want to get home for Christmas, and it's, it's really tremendous. And we've had this great opportunity to study and learn from both the first offshore wind farm in the U.S. waters, as well as um, to collect baseline information to help inform our future decisions. So with respect to what drives the science, where do we get our ideas and how do we decide what we're going to be doing in an area? And the very first and foremost thing is that um, we have the National Environmental Policy Act. And through that process, we start off with a notice of intent, which means that we go out to the public and we ask, what are your concerns about the proposed project? So what drives our science, most importantly, is hearing from all of you, what are your environmental concerns, and what do you think we should be doing in terms of science? So almost everything that we do is, de is defined by what we hear from the public through one form or another. And then this information goes to our subject matter experts who try to write the analyses, and they learn through writing and preparing these analyses of the proposed action and the potential impacts. They think about what do we need to know, what do we know, what's already out there. And there they also identify places where, you know, they feel like, well, we, if we learned a little bit more, next time we could have an even better um, analysis. And then also we go to these public forums such as this, and we listen to all of you, and we hear your ideas and thoughts and concerns. So we, and then finally, annually, we go out to our stakeholders and we say, um, what are your study ideas? And we look at all of those. Last year, we got about 80 study ideas just for along the Atlantic with respect to renewable energy that we had to sort through and look to it. So taking all of those ideas from all of you, we have to prioritize. Obviously, we don't have an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of time. So we need to look at what's being proposed and think about that prioritization. Well, first and foremost, our program is an applied science program, which means that we take that science and we inform our decisions. So we need to ask ourselves the question when somebody brings a study idea to us, well, how would we use that information if we had it? And so we, and we need to be able to clearly articulate that. So that's the first filter in terms of identifying what we need to do. We also look at um, another aspect is that we only have limited funds. So we're always looking to partner as we've pa partnered with MassCEC to collect baseline data. We partnered with URI to collect scientific information. We're always looking to leverage our funds and partner. We also partner with Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and others to collect the basic information that they also need to do their analysis as part of the consultation process. And then finally, another aspect that I wanted to bring to the table and open for discussion is that we also are looking at retiring risk. That was one of the great opportunities with being able to study and do all sorts of science at Block Island Wind Farm. Because before anything was built, we were dealing with potential impacts that may be occurring as opposed to the actual impacts that are occurring. And we want to spend our time, energy, and resources on those that are the most significant and understand how we can reduce or mitigate those and spend a little bit less time on those that are merely concerns and as we learn, maybe not as much of a concern as it needs to be. And to be able to retire that risk and say, yes, we thought about that impact, but we've also learned that it's really not that significant. Let's move on to the things that are more significant. So with that, that's how we prioritize.
Thank you, Tyler. And it's so wonderful to see so many people here um, you know, at this conference. When we first came up with it, we weren't really sure how interested folks would be. So kudos to Jen McCann and the team for getting the word out. And, and thanks to all of you for, for coming down. Um, so in my role at Deepwater Wind, I'm responsible for identifying our entire science agenda. So what science do we need to do early on during site selection? Um, so pre-construction, pre-permit application. What do we need to do to submit a complete permit application? So what do the regulations require us to do? And then working with stakeholders, agencies, um, the general public, work through what do we need to do um, to address concerns from those groups? So we kind of bucket science into pre-construction, during construction, and post-construction. And that ends up being a lot of time and effort and dollars spent. So it's really important for us that we have a very thoughtful and methodical approach to identifying what we need to do and when. And we have some some general rules of thumb is we like our science to always be collaborative. So if we're doing fishery science, we like to do it on a fishing vessel, whether that be a charter vessel or a commercial vessel, depending on the study. Um, we like to build our science on other protocols or other studies. For example, at the Block Island Wind Farm, you're gonna hear about the demersal trawl survey. So that's executed on Captain Rodman Sykes' vessel out of Point Judith, the Virginia Marie's. And the data is collected in a format that it can be analyzed with the NEMAP data that's also collected, other trawl survey that data that's collected so that we're building a more robust regional data set, not just creating a little data set that only deep water wind has access to and it only can be used uh, in itself without, um, we like to add to other data sets and really make the regional science um, more robust. We also like to um, ensure that we're trying to meet some of the regional science goals. So there's been a lot of effort invested in recent years by a lot of people in this room uh, with the regional ocean plans and their science priorities that are defined in there. So when we think about science, we're looking at that list and saying, okay, you know, can we do this a little more or a little different and help to satisfy this question that we have as a region? So we try to look at things very holistically um, but a lot of what we do is driven by regulations and data needs. So we, as we think about um, the science, we also try to take the opportunities when they arise. You're going to hear at this conference about a nanotag study that the Fish and Wildlife Service was doing to track uh, threatened and endangered avian species. We were able to put a nanotag receiver on the Block Island wind farm, and then we're able to make that study more robust, and, and also it benefits us because we're able to use that data but really kind of t looking at federal and state funds that are being sent, spent and trying to match with them or even increase the value of those studies. We were very happy with Boehm's commitment to the rodeo program, which you're gonna hear a lot about. Um, I'm not gonna try to say what the acronym is because I always get it wrong, <laughs> but they invested milli <laughs> <laughs> millions and millions of dollars studying Block Island Wind Farm. And we were able to uh, coordinate with them, let them know when certain activities were going to occur. We provide them data when they need it. Completely independent science that's conducted by a third party, but it is conducted in a way that we really appreciate and that sort of a commitment is very, very important as well. So looking forward, as we think, as we go through hearing over the next couple of days, we're going to be here. I want folks to think about, you know, as as more wind is off the coast of southern New England, we should be thinking about more regional collaboration, about what science is appropriate. Um, just because we did a study at Block Island doesn't mean we should do the same study again at the next project. We should be looking at the issues. What issues do we have regionally? What do we really want to invest in? Everyone should present pretend it's their own money and think about, you know, what is the priority for this science? And then um, 
as we think about creative ways to moving forward in the coming years, um, work together as a, as a community to determine what's the priorities and what are the issues and think thoughtfully about how to address them. Thank you. Um, as a regulator, <coughs> we, uh, with a very sort of wide breadth of issues that we are responsible for looking at, there are any number of issues that we would obviously like to get science on. So often for us, it's trying to winnow through the existing literature that's out there to try to understand what the impacts might be from farms that have already been constructed and then apply that knowledge back to the issue that we're looking at here and what is absolutely important for us to study uh, in terms of these projects. The first, obviously, is the environment itself uh, that we're constructing in. Uh, what does that environment look like? What are the current stressors on it? And how is that system already reacting uh, to those stressors? Because that will become important in terms of the impacts that we're looking at uh, putting into the system uh, from the additional development in that area. The other important area that we focus in on as a coastal management agency are the users themselves. Who are the users? Uh, as I said before, uh, what are they using it for? When are they using it? Those types of things. But the users have their own questions uh, and science that they want to have done. That's as important as many times any regulators desire to study certain issues. So part of that is trying to integrate uh, what the users would like to understand from the system itself, uh, from the project and those impacts, and trying to make sure that that gets incorporated within the, the study design. The project itself, um, any project that we're looking at has certain technologies available to them. Each one of those technologies, for example, in foundation types, carry different impacts. And uh, trying to understand what the options are in terms of all those uh, technologies that are available, what those impacts might be, and then try to put that in context of the system and the users that you just had. Uh, if we're looking at a floating production system, for instance, that's very different than a monopile uh, in terms of the impacts and, and what we might look at uh, in terms of the science itself. There's also long-term and cumulative impacts that we have to understand, not just from the, as we often tend to focus in, just on the construction of that project, but long-term, what are those impacts? And then over the region here, what will be those cumulative impacts that we're looking at uh, as we start to build out more and more wind farms? Because there will be potentially cumulative impacts. And then lastly, I think, and it's been mentioned several times here, Climate change is out there. Uh, it's changing our baseline already. Uh, it's changing the system, even as we try to understand and monitor it right now, and understanding the influence of climate change on the uh, resource and the users, uh, and how that is interacting with the project is also important, uh, because it is that underlying current that's out there that is of a magnitude that is uh, unheard of, I think, in, in our, our modern realm of science. So I think those are the types of things as a regulator we tend to focus in on uh, and what tends to drive us in terms of the science. Ultimately, all that gets embodied in a permit for us. Uh, and I know the developer probably feels that it's a regulatory pile on by the end because there are many, many agencies that are placing conditions on that. Uh, project as you go forward. If uh, you were to ask one of our, our uh, staff members, Dave Reese, for instance, who monitors our project up in the, in the uh, audience there, he has a binder of all the permit conditions uh, and science that needs to be done uh, for this project. Even though it's a small scale project, there is an incredible amount of science that is being done to try to understand this in the overall context of what we're looking at. Good morning. Thanks for having us here today. Um, so I'm just going to sort of uh, build off what each of these uh, uh, folks have uh, said this morning and uh, kind of set a little uh, context. Um, so, and I, I go back, we've heard uh, some references to uh, some offshore renewable projects, Cape Wind, for example, and, and projects uh, that Jeff mentioned even before that. Um, 
So going back about a decade uh, or even more um, in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island, in the Northeast, um, we were seeing um, significant uh, ecosystem signals and concerns uh, that were manifesting themselves. Uh, fish stocks, declines, harmful algal blooms, uh, warming temperatures, uh, ocean acidification, uh, coastal eutrophication, the list goes on. Uh, around the same time, we are seeing uh, new and increasing demands and proposals for uh, uses and facilities and projects in our coastal and ocean space. And that's not just renewable energy, but renewable energy uh, definitely uh, a key driver there. Um, and I think, and I think Jeff touched on this, um, as managers, uh, as, as a society, I think folks were sort of recognizing that this sort of first come, first serve, reactive approach to stewardship of our coastal and ocean areas uh, wasn't really getting the job done. Um, and that's why you saw in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island, this commitment, um, both legislatively and uh, through other vehicles, uh, to uh, better and smarter ocean management and ocean planning. Um, and I think a couple of the key principles that uh, underline uh, better ocean management uh, and better ocean planning is the commitment to best available science, best available data, best available information, and stakeholder engagement and participation. Uh, you can't do that without those two uh, key components. Grover mentioned it before. Um, so in Massachusetts, and you, and you heard Bill reference this, um, uh, we use uh, not only our ocean plan for our state waters, um, but the uh, consultative bodies that help uh, advise the Commonwealth, our Ocean Advisory Commission and our Ocean Science uh, Council um, to uh, you know, provide one aspect of engagement. Um, but as we were building our plan, um, we recognized that uh, the science, uh, the subject matter experts, the industry experts um, were all out there, but we needed to tap them. Um, so we used uh, a, a number of technical working groups uh, to be able to tap you know, over 100 of these uh, experts uh, out in the field uh, to really get our handle on um, you know, what was the sort of best available science, what was the lay of the land. When we talk about uh, bringing um, offshore wind, which, as you heard before, is a significant renewable energy resource to help meet, as Bill said, our greenhouse gas reduction goals, uh, both in Massachusetts and in the region, um, and you heard from Jeff as well, offshore wind needs to be part of the picture. Uh, it absolutely needs to be. Um, so I think uh, what you'll hear over the next uh, day, two days, um, is that there's been a lot of work uh, done uh, on the science um, and that uh, there has been already a lot of lessons learned. Uh, Grover talked before at the previous panel about this concept of kind of scaling. You know, you start at the big picture uh, through the BOEM process uh, planning. Okay, where are we going to do our uh, request for information, which is this broad, broad, broad process information, winnowing down what is going to be our call for information area, ultimately getting to a wind energy area, and then figuring out where our lease areas are. That's where we are now, but within those lease areas, uh, we still are going to be working with the developers and the regulators and our stakeholders on figuring out where in those areas are we going to be siting uh, the actual uh, turbines, uh, and what is the transmission component? And so much of this can be focused on the actual wind energy areas. We can't lose sight of the importance of tra transmission. So you're going to hear a lot of great information. I think that's going to be very helpful for us uh, to sort of contextualize. And then you guys can help inform us as we start to talk about the path forward. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, so building on what you said about sort of the whole process of identifying areas, I want to go back to Mary and, and ask you to sort of say a little more about how the science actually gets used uh, by BOEM and the regulatory review and permitting process. Okay, yes, Tyler. Um, and just as one example with the Massachusetts wind energy areas, um, as we were going through the process and deciding what would be leased, uh, we had information about sea ducks, and there's an area of persistent use of sea ducks that was on the northeast part of it off of Nantucket Island. And we actually removed several blocks from the offering because of the presence of the sea ducks and having that information. And all that information was available to us because of the surveys that have been done by Massachusetts and by ourselves. So that's just one example of how we take that information and use it to identify the areas that we should remove as well as the areas that we should keep. Um, there's many, many other examples, but I'll start with that. That's great. Thanks, Mary. 
And Bruce, back to you. You'd mentioned um, sort of using best available science, and you know, a lot of times uh, that information just isn't available. So. Can you talk a little bit about how, in Massachusetts, you've worked to address some of those information and data gaps? Sure. Um, and I think that um, a good example of this is, um, you know, sort of going back uh, a few years in time to, as I mentioned before, uh, around that 2009, 2010 uh, period in time. So. Uh, that's about when we had wrapped up and released our state's first ocean management plan. Um, and through that effort, we had a pretty exhaustive, um, you know, compilation and synthesis uh, and understanding of available uh, data and information. Um, our, our plan is focused on state waters, but our, uh, you know, analysis and aggregation of data was not limited. It was, it was all, so it definitely covered uh, federal waters. Uh, but when we were working with BOEM, and as they set up their uh, Massachusetts uh, Intergovernmental Task Force, which is their sort of consultative body under the um, Energy Policy Act, um, we recognized that we really needed to get a really uh, solid handle on, um, in particular, uh, for that uh, area sort of south of the islands and um, kind of west of um, Great, Great South Channel. Um, you know, what was the abundance and distribution, particularly of marine uh, mammals, uh, whales in particular, endangered whales, uh, marine birds, uh, and commercial fishing. Uh, so with uh, the good folks at Mass CEC, Tyler, Bill, and, and others, um, and the Commonwealth, um, engaged a uh, contractor to um, do a really deep dive, uh, literature review, data sets, uh, really understanding. So at the end of that, um, we, you know, uh, came up and we had information uh, on those uh, sort of three areas. Um, uh, but uh, really, uh, the further analysis revealed that um, the level of, of survey effort uh, was not uh, on par with uh, sort of other uh, regional um, areas. And um, if you think about, you know, identifying that the scarcity of a, a species or a group of species, is that attributed to just the natural pattern, ecosystem pattern, or is that attributed to the lack of survey effort to identify uh, whether that scarcity is a real thing or it's a bias? Uh, so we recognized, uh, and I think uh, the peers uh, from our sort of you know, science counselors advise as well, that uh, we really needed to up our survey uh, effort, particularly for marine mammals, marine turtles, and marine birds. Uh, and so the Commonwealth uh, invested, uh, and then Boehm uh, soon partnered on with us uh, in uh, now going on four years of uh, marine mammal aerial surveys uh, led by New England Aquarium and, and Scott Krause and his team there. Uh, three years of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, three years of um, uh, passive acoustics led by a uh, team at Cornell. Uh, three years of marine bird work uh, led by the College of Staten Island, uh, and then um, uh, two years of uh, benthic uh, seafloor habitat characterization uh, led by S. Mass and, and Professor Kevin Stokesbury. Uh, so you'll probably hear more about that information there, but that's um, a really good example of um, making sure uh, that as we are engaging in the BOEM process, uh, that we are bringing uh, the significant amount of information filling identified gaps uh, into the process. And this is sort of concept of uh, iteration and um, adaptive management. The last point I'll make is that, um, you know, I think that same uh, level of sort of filling gaps is, is now sort of uh, coming into focus with regards to um, fishing and fish, fisheries resources, which I, I know you'll hear more about um, later today. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Grover, the SAMP has been, uh, I think enormously successful and particularly in generating a lot of uh, great scientific information. I think what, one thing that's unique about the SAMP area in particular is it you know, stretches from you know, state waters and encompasses into federal waters. And so I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit about you know, differences that you see between how science gets used and generated between state waters uh, and, or sort of state and federal uh, uses. Yeah, uh, I think there are um, several significant differences. When we look at the federal process, it tends to be uh, very oriented around the, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and trying to answer those questions that they have. And they have a broad range of questions and acts that they have to consider when they're looking at this. If you've ever looked at the marine environment and the regulations that are present there, as long as, and the statutes, there's probably over 100 uh, that have uh, to be considered and come into play. From the state side, I think, and this is no fault of, of the feds, it just is, 
I think there's a certain amount of detachment at times, whereas the state tends to be more focused on particularly the users and how we're about to impact those users. So there's a, uh, because not only are we concerned about that, but we're responsible to those individual groups. So I think you see, tend to see a lot more uh, focus on that issue at times from the state perspective uh, as, as we go forward, and I mentioned that already several times. Also, sometimes, like in the Block Island project, we have to overcome certain deficiencies. When we went to um, the Army Corps and we're asking them about how supposing the Block Island wind farm gets to the point that it needs to be constructed, how do we go about reviewing the design of those plans and reviewing that and permitting that and then ensuring the construction is done to the, uh, the plan specifications. Um, the Army Corps um, essentially said that would be the developer's problem. Uh, we didn't view it that way. So we uh, embodied within the plan and in the regulations and ultimately required a certification and verification agent that did a review of the design and also then oversaw the construction for us to make sure it was um, constructed as, as it was designed. So there are sometimes gaps that we're filling, but I think also there's uh, obviously because the proximity to the, the users, we have a, a, a greater attachment to those, those people and trying to figure out how we're dealing or impacting those. So I think that's some of the major differences, but. Great, thanks Grover. Aileen, you um, mentioned, uh, sort of raised a question of, you know, what are the issues, what are the priorities, and how do we get that science done? This one opposed to you, um, just the question of how you might go about scoping that again. What are sort of the lessons learned, and how might you do science uh, differently going forward? Mm -hmm. So at, at Block Island, um, we... It was a smaller project, and we were pretty focused on in in the discussion that the Grove just had that we were in state waters, and we were pretty focused on the impacts that we would have um, to the users within the vicinity of the wind farm, and also along the cable route. And we were also, since it was the first project, we were trying to answer questions like. Um, will there be any fish thereafter? So we were kind of, we had these questions and we, we had to answer them. So we were trying to, I think we, in a lot of ways we were taking questions off the table, right? So we were, um, so we tried to do thoughtful studies that, that would address these bigger questions like will the fish return, but then also trying to tease out what are the impacts from pile driving on the, the stock. So that's why we did it during construction. So I think that, you know, moving forward as we go out into federal waters and um, the projects, these lease areas are often generally quite large, so you can expect that projects will be phased within the lease areas, so you're going to expect that there may be, I mean, we have in our, in the Rhode Island, Massachusetts wind energy area, we have a power purchase agreement for the South Fork wind farm, it's gonna be up to 15 turbines, but then we're, we'd like to also sell power to Massachusetts or Connecticut or anybody who'd like to buy it, Rhode Island. Um, so we'd like to sell more power from that lease area, but it's gonna be phased, right? We're gonna go 15 next, and then after that maybe we have 20 you know, 30. But what I think that as we're going forward, we want to be still answering these questions that are kind of global about the impacts um, to, of wind energy. But we also want to start thinking about ways that we can start creating that regional um, baseline. So building off of the science that Boehm and Massachusetts have done, we want to add to that baseline so that we can be cre addressing this question of cumulative impacts um, through the science that we're doing. So for example, Boehm has invested in multi-year lobster surveys in the Rhode Island, Massachusetts wind energy area. If we were to do a lobster survey out there, we would want to make sure that we were enhancing that study and so that we're thinking ahead about potential cumulative analysis and regional analysis so it's a bit of a different twist on how we would design things um, but we really want to make sure that we keep that as a as a top priority that's great 
Let me just put a general question back in terms of, you, know, you mentioned um, developing regional science, and that sort of speaks to this idea of collaboration. Um, and maybe just hear from a couple of you who wants to chime in, just you know, what you see as sort of the needs and priorities and, and structures for implementing that collaboration going forward. Who wants to take a crack? I don't know if I'm going to answer your question or the question I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to what Aileen mentioned about the um, putting the VHF receivers on the on the um, on the turbines, and go back to Pam, who's sitting in the audience, and all the great work she did initially. Um, Bohm funded research with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they came to us and said, "We'd really like to do some of this tagging work." She started off with common turns just to do proof of concept and moved and was able to demonstrate to people that we could put tags on roseate turns, which are endangered, as well as piping plovers. It was a process of moving through and working with people and collaboratively demonstrating that something could work. And then working with um, deep water wind to be able to continue that and actually look up close, because really uh, trying to figure out how do you study birds and their interactions with turbines offshore. It's a, really very difficult question. On land, they collect dead bodies. Well, how are you going to collect dead bodies offshore? You can't. So this was one testing of, of an, a, a possibility of being able to look at fine uh, scale movements around the wind turbines and see whether there's actually a collision risk for these birds or not. And that comes with putting the tags on the birds as well as putting the um, receivers on the turbines as well as on shore and, uh, and working all, everybody working together and that's my big message is that all of us working together to answer these questions because we have to do it in a collaborative way rather than some people being out there and not working with the others and then somebody else doing something and then you end up with not being the most uh, resourceful and how you, you know there's limited resources and such and also we all learn together and take that forward into our next efforts. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that uh, I think when we look at issues, uh, particularly like the right whale, for instance, and the mortality that has occurred this year, uh, obviously it's a heightened issue. Um, and the construction best management practices that we have in order to reach efficiencies of scale aren't that great right now. Um, so trying to understand and get better science and better technology in place so that we can uh, prevent any impact uh, to the, the future uh, population of the right whales, I think is something that uh, both Massachusetts and ourselves have been focused in on uh, quite a bit. And there's a cooperative study that's underway right now uh, between Massachusetts and Rhode Island, for instance, looking at acoustic warning systems uh, and their potential for, uh, particularly during the construction process, to, to minimize those impacts. I think two other areas where we're looking at cooperation um, between the states, and, and I think there's a lot of potential there, obviously, is the fishery issue. Uh, fisheries obviously move in a regional context here, not held by state boundaries. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to, I think, get particularly baseline information on these populations at the regional level. Uh, also, the states have been having discussions uh, relative to cables and cable routes. Uh, because, again, that's an area that is ripe for efficiencies, I think, in terms of, of doing that. If we look at, uh, for instance, in Europe, um, they've gotten away from this concept of project-by-project project cables and actually looking at a marine grid that would bypass a lot of the issues that the upland grids have, uh, but essentially also provide for a plug-and-play system. So I think there is a lot of potential for uh, regional cooperation, so. Thank you, and I, Aileen, I apologize. I wanna make sure we have a couple minutes left. I just wanna make sure we get to some questions from the audience here, so. Um, questions? Yes. This question is for Mary. Mary, uh, you had mentioned that based on um, studies that had been conducted that you had, uh, or Bohm had retired some concerns, environmental or otherwise, um, based on studies. Could you provide some examples of such concerns that have been retired? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure everything, anything is ever fully retired, but um, I don't know, I'm gonna steal some thunder from later on. Um, we've been out um, monitoring the sound, underwater sound during operation from the Block Island Wind Farm. We have actual measurements and, as, um, and it's very, very low or next to nothing. And so the big concern is that there's this, all this sound being generated during the operations, which would have 
um, could be a concern because it's 25 years that they're going to be out there. And we've got the actual measurements up close, and Jim Miller will speak to that a little bit more, that really says, you know, it's really not that much. Maybe we need to be thinking about other things besides that. So that's just one example. Um, another example is that we had the public say, well, what happens if all the turbines fall over, and what kind of an oil spill are you going to have? And we did modeling work with URI and um, others in terms of ASA, et cetera, in terms of doing mo modeling and saying the volumes are so, going to be so small of any kind of liquids that could be spilled that even under the worst circumstances, it's minuscule. And so we essentially looked at the problem, identified it, uh, studied it, and came up with, well, it's pretty minor. We can address it, but we don't need to study it any further. So that's a couple of examples. Great. Um, I think that we're unfortunately out of time right now. The panelists will be here uh, today. so. Uh, you can feel free to get in touch with them and talk it up more, but uh, please join me in thanking them. And we'll be taking a break until 11.05, so see everybody back here soon. Couple more seconds. Can everyone hear me? All right, excellent. Uh, my name is Dave Prescott. I am the South County Coast Keeper uh, for Save the Bay out of the Westerly office. Um, I have the uh, good, fortune, uh, good fortune to introduce uh, the session on stakeholder um, observations today. We have five great panelists who will share their observations on the planning and development of the Block Island Wind Farm. So today we have Cass Schumann, staff reporter and web editor from the Block Island Times. Scott Cummings, associate state director from the Rhode Island chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Catherine Bose, senior manager from the National Wildlife Federation. Chris Brown, uh, commercial fisherman. And Edward Anthes Washburn, director of the Port of New Bedford. So uh, I'll have them start and go ahead, Cash. began working at the Block Island Times, my editor said my main big assignment was going to be covering the first offshore wind farm in the United States, the Block Island Wind Farm. 
And the first thing that came to my mind was, do you mean I'll be covering windmills? Because um, that's basically all I knew about uh, the offshore wind business. And uh, flash forward three years later and a lot of research, and I know a little bit more about uh, windmills. Um, it's been interesting, you know, living on Block Island and covering the story up close, being at basically ground zero, seeing the project go through permitting to funding, and then seeing the first steel in the water moment, and then, you know, some dissenting voices, you know, saying that, uh, you know, they, their view shed was going to be ruined. So the developers was having to deal with that as well as construct this, uh, these incredible structures in 90 feet of ocean water, three miles off the southeast coast of Block Island. Um, but they, you know, they, they forged the path. They, they uh, continued with construction, and um, it was interesting seeing them go and learn. There was a lot of learning that I observed. You know, they had to bring in these jack-up vessels and special equipment to overcome the early challenges. And it was interesting seeing and standing there on the bluffs when they, that day that they first powered the island. Um, Jeff Grabowski men mentioned it earlier, you know, the, the old noisy diesel generators were silenced. The workers at the power company talked about how they could hear the birds chirping for the first time. Um, and of course, 100 million gallons of diesel fuel went away. Now we're down to 500 gallons a year. So that's a significant amount. Um, and besides that, um, you know, as far as the involvement with the community, it was interesting. Deepwater was really good about working with the community and getting the information out. It was hard for me at first because I had to decipher the technology into layman's terms so I could communicate it to the reader. But I think working with them um, was fruitful, you know? And slowly but surely, you know, the diesel generators were shut off, and I think the descending voices were shut off as well. Um, so anyway, I'll be, I don't want to, you know, talk too long here because I know we want to open it up to questions, but um, I'll be interested in seeing what happens moving forward with the wind farm and also learning more, you know, at this event and hearing what people have to say. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Scott Cummings. I'm with the Nature Conservancy in Rhode Island. I'm the uh, Associate State Director. I oversee our conservation and operations throughout the state. I've, uh, I've also lived on Block Island for the last 24 years and have been doing uh, bird research um, over that period of time too. And uh, Originally full time and then more recently uh, in my spare time. Um, as far as the Nature Conservancy is concerned, we, we've been involved uh, really since the beginning in the Special Area Management Plan, both in the, the spatial portion of it and also uh, facilitating the, uh, the, the avian portion um, on Block Island, um, you know, from my perspective, the, the 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 scientific work that's been done has been solid. It's uh, and it's ongoing, and we're still learning. I think that's the really important part of this project is not what was done, just what was done at the beginning, but what's being done now and how it's going to inform how we go forward. Um, you know, I think. I think it's super important to realize, you know, as Cash was saying, you know, it, there's a real local benefit here that the diesel generators stop. We we save a million <laughs> gallons of diesel every year, um, but also, you know, climate change is our biggest threat. It is what I wake up every morning trying to figure out how we're going to mitigate it here and beyond. And you know, this is one small step, but we have lots of small steps that are going to be required. And you know, um, I think that that this is. Um, you know, really showing the way potentially of how to how to move forward. Um, you know, and then the last part I will just say, uh, it's added the wind turbines have added so much to my Block Island experience. You go out um, by boat, out around the turbines, just past the turbines. It's really like National Geographic out there. There are whales, multiple species of whales, multiple species of dolphins, sea turtles, sharks all sorts of seabirds. It's a really spectacular spe spectacular place that um, is benefiting from the increased structure down there. Hi there, I'm Catherine Bose with the National Wildlife Federation. 
And just quickly, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with National Wildlife Federation, we're one of the oldest and largest conservation organizations in the country, uh, based in DC with offices um, across the country. I'm based in our Northeast office, uh, where we run our offshore wind program. And um, to echo what others others have said, um, you know, we truly believe as an organization that climate change is the single greatest threat facing wildlife here in Rhode Island, across the country, and around the globe. And so we're firmly committed. Uh, to seeing you know, a rapid um, acceleration of renewable energy development um, in a way that's done responsibly. And that's why we're so excited about the opportunity of offshore wind power and why we launched our campaign back in 2010. Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, that's the year we, we really started to look into this closely um, for those following the federal policy conversation that was sort of the last uh, Last time, an attempt to move a federal policy uh, imploded, and we as an organization looked around and said, where can we make really game-changing impact um, in accelerating the clean energy that we know we and wildlife so desperately need? And here in the Northeast especially, the opportunity of offshore wind really jumps off the page. Um, it's been discussed a lot, so um, I'll leave it there. But that's, that's why we're so excited about it. But of course, it has to be done right. It has to be developed responsibly. And you know that's easy to say, but what does that really mean? Um, and we think about it in kind of the buckets that Grover laid out this morning. There's sort of where the projects are located, and then there's how um, the timing and method of, of the construction that, that occurs there. And uh, we we came on the scene, um, again, a little late. Um, those of you, a uh, huge shout out to the incredible leadership here of Rhode Island in developing the Ocean Samp and bringing together such um, an incredible broad uh, set of stakeholders around the table to really identify a good spot for a wind farm. Um, and you know that work had been done prior to when NWF began to engage in the conversation. Um, and so what we were really talking about was, okay, what's going to go there, um, and how can we, um, you know, look at how what is it going to take for us to support this project? And that's where I really feel like the leadership of Deepwater Winds um, really was exceptional in pulling together the environmental community specifically, my organization, our partners at. Conservation Law Foundation, Save the Bay, TNC, Audubon, all, you know, uh, many, many folks in this room and many not in this room uh, to really um, very early in the process show us what, what data they had, what, what, um, what their understanding was of the area, what their plans were, and really in a meaningful way solicited our input in, in how this wind farm construction should move forward. Um, and, you know, we um, at my organization and others, again, you know, really um, looked uh, looked closely at the science, looked closely at the proposal, and and worked out what we believed was a construction process in particular that could meet the um, incredibly urgent conservation needs of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, it's been mentioned a bit this morning. I know there's going to be a lot of great conversation over the next couple days about marine mammals and right whales specifically. But you know, since I'm the first one to say it, you know, this is one of the most endangered species on the planet. Um, there is you know a very um, important need to ensure that those those needs are addressed in order to see the scale up of offshore wind that we want to see all along the coast um, that does overlay, uh, quite frankly, with, with the migration and, and areas where the right whales are. So we know we need to get it right, and we truly believe that the Block Island Wind Farm set a very high bar uh, for, for what that means and what developing offshore wind in a way that um, is compatible with right whale conservation can look like. Um, so that really came down to, um, first and foremost, uh, planning the construction later in the in the summer outside of the spring uh, critical migration um, time um, as well as um, you know a host of other uh, protections that we can we can get into more detail of but you know I just there's a lot to talk about and um, everyone who knows me in this room knows I could talk about this all day long so um, I'll leave it there but I want to just say that I think the principles that have been discussed this morning about really um, robust um, data and robust and meaningful stakeholder engagement are the absolute keys to seeing successful projects move forward. It's really exciting to hear from Jim Bennett about how much area has already been leased off the Atlantic. We're excited to see that, but for projects to successfully move forward and meet the incredible um, ambitious goals that Bill White in Massachusetts has set and other states, you know, we've got to see successful project proposals um, advanced um, and approved. And that's where I think there's really an important role for not only government and scientists, but especially um, you know, industry leadership as well to, to design projects that can ensure the broad uh, support of stakeholders like mine and, and others. Wow, you talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. How are we doing this morning, folks? Good? 
Welcome to my state. <laughs> my name is Chris Brown. I'm a commercial fisherman out of Point Judith, Rhode Island. I am a, a reluctant representative of the industry for the last 30 years. I guess not that reluctantly, but I'm still doing it. Uh, that puts me in weird places at times. This is one of them. Uh, I represent a number of people who want nothing to do with wind farms. I have grandchildren and see their value. Uh, it's complicated, right? Things are never easy. Things are never black and white. You know, uh, I cannot speak highly enough looking back at the process that Rhode Island went through, the painstaking process, the SAMP process that let us, the representatives of this industry, transition from, you know, shivering, scared, huddling masses of fishermen wondering if they were going to be put out of business to productive citizens who were able to look at this from a higher altitude. When you scare a fisherman, you have a worthy adversary on your hands. Uh, when you scare a bunch of fishermen, you unify your opposition. We fight like Spartans. <laughs> Better to never get to that point. You know, uh, in this process, we went to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Uh, it was a marathon. Anything less would have cheapened the process and not delivered forward the product that we have before us. Uh, tip of the hat to Grover, CRMC, and uh, Deepwater Wind. Tip of the hat. You know, uh, in this process, my guys first came to me after the first meeting, and you know there was a resounding, "Hell no, we won't go." That's it. Okay, Chris, stop them. Go get them. Wipe them out. I'm looking at the checkbook of the organization. We had like twenty-two hundred and twenty-eight dollars in the in the bank. I had a full dance card of fishing lined up and you know over the course of time we, we talked the guys down off of that position. We realized that our greatest defense uh, was to become willing participants in the process and have our opinion valued and respected. So we did that and it was the best thing we ever did. I'm very happy that we did. Uh, so if, if there are any other developers in the room, I would like you to note that how, how really important it is for you to take the threat to commercial fishing off of the table at the very onset of the conversation. You know, we, after we got to a point where we were no longer afraid and we were productive participants and respected and had a voice and felt as if we could do this, we could survive it. You know, we, uh, we really started to look differently at ourselves. You know, wind farms are not a solution to climate change. They are one of many. Among the tenets of climate change, some of the most threatening to a guy who really loves food is the fact that climate uh, change threatens our food systems. It makes it harder to grow a bushel of corn, wheat, tomatoes, and it does the very same thing in the ocean. So we started to think of ourselves in a more productive light, one that may amplify our value with the public. That is, uh, we are renewable protein. We are a logical and reasonable partner of renewable energy. We are in the same ocean. We share the same street, we share each other's backyard, and how refreshing it would be to work positively in the same direction uh, as someone who could be perceived as an adversary. Hopefully, Washington is watching. Uh, maybe they could learn something from people who are potentially adversarial working together for a goal. Having said that, as this movement expands up and down the coast, a cautionary tale to developers that you do not attempt to cheapen the process. Do not put one less hour of work into it than we did here in Rhode Island, or you will 
not get anywhere you wish to be. Big business's first response to a situation is to extract greater profits from its efforts. And I would say that this is one area where you should not. Uh, we are supportive, but we are willing to fight this battle one site at a time. You will deal with a different user group of fishermen in every region where you go. One site abutting another will engage different fishermen with different views and different perspectives. Their one common thing is they are first fishermen and must provide for their families, and they are fearful of that. You know, we are in the process of developing a sustainable fishery in this nation, and we are constantly revisiting the definition. A sustainable fishery at some point, I believe, will you know, the definition will include our ability to solve our own problems. In all of this, uh, remuneration is considered part of the landscape. Deep water wind invested in the fishing community in the state of Rhode Island in such a way uh, that we were able to develop the internal capacity to run a training program for young fishermen. You know, we didn't want to take the money and do foolish things with it. We wanted to take the money and show that a partnership and an investment, investment in this industry would yield results that were beneficial. We are trying to create a greater societal outcome via our involvement and via our partnership. Uh, so we're proud of what we have done as this, uh, as the development of bigger wind farms expands and, and goes up and down the coast, we will again talk about remuneration. It is a function of change in this case. As a leader of the industry, uh, if I am to accept and embrace change, you have to present me with a, a scenario in the future that is better than the one prior to wind farms. My new reality with wind farms has to have a component of investment in the industry so that I can represent myself scientifically. I have been fishing for 40 years, have 8,000 days at sea, and could tell you things about the ocean that would curl your hair and have you sitting on the edge of your seat, but yet I have no value scientifically because everything I say is anecdotal. I need to find a way to translate what I see, what I know, what I feel, what I believe into data that is usable by the largest system and the greater public. We wish desperately to be a fishery that is guided by science and preserved by the concepts of conservation. Uh, we can do that much better in a partnership going forward with people who we share our ocean with than without them. So, uh, Boehm, you have scared us to death as an industry. Uh, we feel, and it is your job to prove me wrong, that you have a myopic perspective as to how to improve the utility of the Atlantic Ocean. We believe that your authority in Washington is defined exclusively by political indulgence. That is frightening for me. Uh, the civics lessons I learned is that this nation is guided by a principle of checks and balances. I'm not exactly sure who checks you or balances you. That is frightening. So you are constantly, we're monitoring and watching to make sure that you do not fall too much in love with the coin of your realm, which is electricity or power. It is our belief that a government agency should take into consideration and gracefully translate the currency that you are most familiar with into a need to recognize intelligence and our ability to cultivate, nurture, protect, defend our culture, our resources, and the needs of greater life. Thank you. So I think it's, um, it'd be, I could just say what Chris said. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm Ed Washburn. I'm the port director in New Bedford. Um, New Bedford has been the number one fishing port in the country by value uh, for 17 years in a row. And 
a lot of what um, can be harvested on in the Northwest Atlantic lands in New Bedford. Uh, the biggest uh, share of that value comes from scallops. About 75% um, of the value of the port comes from sea scallops. So that is certainly one of our our big concerns. Um, uh, and, but there's 300 fishing vessels that are home ported in New, in New Bedford. Another 200 that call on the port of New Bedford, and um, really understanding what their issues are um, as as offshore wind begins to take root um, is really important. And and really, it, you know, I, I think our goal um, and and w we were hired by uh, Deepwater Wind to be their fisheries representative. We offered that service to all three developers that were in the uh, area south of Martha's Vineyard. Um, and the goal was really to figure out, all right, what are the issues ahead of time? Uh, the, where, where are the potential areas where conflict can happen um, in the area south of the vineyard? And if we can mitigate it, if we can get ahead of that and work cooperatively, which we've been doing great work with uh, deep water wind, um, what are the opportunities for the commercial fishing industry? So um, Deepwater has been, has been working very uh, closely with you know, some, of, some of our uh, partners with cooperative research. So uh, engaging, <coughs> excuse me, engaging with the fishing industry so that the science, um, to Chris's point, that has uh, the science of that the fishing industry can collect itself has for years been considered anecdotal um, but cooperative research uh, is an opportunity to really change that to to give a voice to the fishermen turn that anecdotal data into you know quantitative data and what that means for not just um, not just in terms of mitigating issues with offshore wind but with stock assessments and, and using best available science to benefit the commercial fishing industry independent of offshore wind um, is, really, is really exciting. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we do think that if we can work together uh, to make sure offshore wind doesn't impact negatively the commercial fishing industry, that there are some opportunities, um, not just in science, but also workforce development and, and other things that uh, we, can, we can work together on. Before, I, I want to spend, I want to give plenty of time for the audience to ask questions, so I just want to ask one, one question first, and um, um, perception versus reality. I think that this is a, you know, when you think about what the initial perceived impacts when you have a, some sort of development come out there versus what actually happens, can, I would like to hear from your different perspectives about what your experience from that, any, any thoughts on that or whatnot. Chris, you want to go ahead? Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I think we were initially terrorized with the, the grandiose vision of what was going to be. You know, uh, I think I heard today, a, a, not a proposal, but a, a belief that at one time 200 wind farms around Block Island were considered. Whoa. Mm -hmm. It's not a big island, right? <laughs> True. That's not a big island. So I think our response is first fear-based, and then when reality sets in, uh, we have merged gracefully, uh, I believe, the five turbines on the three-mile line southeast of Block Island. I spent all last week towing my net around them, and I made a living. Great. Anyone else want to add to that? Well, I think it was interesting, you know, um, for me early in the process, uh, especially with the centers, um, you know, with the project, uh, thinking that, you know, it was going to be, uh, the wind turbines were going to be loud, that they were going to be eyesores, that they were going to be bird killers. Um, so uh, it was interesting, you know, uh, sorting through all the dissension and all those voices and cutting through to what the facts really were. Um, and I think that speaks to what was mentioned er earlier about the, uh, the whale deaths. Um, so important to get the right information out there. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard when, you know, we're living in an age where there's this tabloid journalism and we're trying to find the facts. And 
I think in the end, when people learn what the facts are, um, I think they're more comfortable. You know, they're they're comfortable with the what this actually is. You know, and that also goes to you know uh, getting c comfortable with the technology actually sitting there now. Um, so yeah, I mean, the perception versus reality is. You know, there's one thing, and then there there is what actually is. And it's interesting now seeing that, you know, there is stable electricity on Block Island, and that the reality is much different than what people feared at first. Catherine? Just one, one quick thought that really is just a, a shout out to URI and everyone in this room for holding this forum, because from our perspective, I think there's a lot we can talk about um, in the hypothetical, but until the wind farm is up, now we can really dig in and see how the impacts um, are, are playing out. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversations over the next two days to really look at real data and kind of cross that, uh, cross the bridge, I guess, between perception and, and reality and what we're really learning about this wind farm. Because while there's a wealth of data to draw on from Europe, um, there are, you know, there's, it can only go so far in terms of applicability here in the US. So there's a lot to, um, to dig into here. Ed? Uh, from, from our perspective, uh, the perception and the reality has been uh, more focused on the areas south of the vineyard, which haven't been built out yet. Um, and one of the things that, one of the fears that, w that the fishing community certainly had was whether or not their voices would be heard. And, and Bruce and Bill, um, you know, the way that they developed the fisheries working group and actually took that area south of the vineyard and cut it by 65% based on input from Kevin Stokesbury and uh, his information on the scallopers and uh, fisherman input really changed the way that, uh, changed the narrative of, you know, this is going to be shoved down our throat. Um, and, and really, you know, for the folks that were engaged, they began to see that they could move the needle on on you know the permitting and the siting parts of of offshore wind, so I think that's that's been really helpful as we continue the conversation and as you know as as the construction plans begin to um, take shape, um, that that level of trust that was created you know after, after years of work, um, both with the Commonwealth and with BOEM, um, has you know ha ha makes makes that a lot easier for the next step. Sky has something too. Right. Yeah, Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Real quick, of course. I would just say um, I think the the planning side of this can't be under um, appreciated. Uh, the the special area management plan and and having a process in place that really um, thinks strategically about how to do this work uh, terrestrially with solar panels and 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 wind turbines. There really isn't that overarching approach and they're just sort of haphazardly popping up sometimes with more environmental impacts than expected and and I would love to see some sort of a plan set up for the terrestrial side as well as the um, the marine side I think that there's a lot to learn from from this situation all right excellent thank you all right so uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience right now if uh, again if you could just uh, speak your name and uh, your question e either myself or one of our panel members will repeat that yep right here You know, I think uh, Rhode Island is a very unique place. I think we built on an already fairly good relationship between Division of Environmental Management, uh, the Governor's Office, and the Fishery. Uh, I think you guys are operating, quite frankly, from a deficit in that respect. Uh, the commercial industry in New York does not feel warm and fuzzy towards you. And I don't think you feel warm and fuzzy towards them either, from what I gather. Uh, so you guys have some in-house work to do before uh, you should let this play out in a national Jerry Springer moment uh, <laughs> for everyone to see. Uh, I think those are fair observations. Uh, I think, if, if you heard my words, taking their ruin off the table early will, will set the tone. Uh, 
Until we find squid spawn glued to the leg of one of these things, your New York guys are going to be nervous. Squid, you know what squid means to them. Squid's 75% of what they make their living on. So uh, they're very, very concerned, and rightfully so, about uh, the sighting uh, and the science and the outcome. The systemic productivity of, of uh, these things impact on squid is where they live right now. Uh, sorry to bring it to you, but just the way it is. <laughs> Okay, Dave. Uh, Dave Monty, a charter fishing captain and fishing journalist. This question is for Chris. Chris, you would uh, you know, uh, praise uh, the Rhode Island effort, deep water wind, mm -hmm. et cetera, about the research that went into it in working uh, with the fishermen. Um, but you can't take that as a blueprint and roll it out somewhere else <coughs> because of different terrain where wind tillage might be used, different uses of the fishery. Absolutely. I think one of the most important sciences that was empowered in this process was social science. The understanding of what it takes to foster meaningful change. And that was clearly involvement. Hours and hours and hours of sitting across the table from each other and talking about the issues. That cannot be overstated as a valuable component to a successful implementation. Uh, the science associated with the existing wind farm is absolutely meaningless uh, to another geographic site. Uh, I would also caution uh, the scientific community from falling in love and duplicating the efforts. We have to be concerned about the impact of scale. Uh, we don't know what the number is, but in Block Island Sound, for just as an example, there is a number of wind turbines that would negatively impact systemic productivity. We don't know what the number it is. It could be ridiculously high. But let's agree that there is a number and that we should never approach that. We should always be sensitive to modify the science with regard to impact of, of scale. And uh, as far as soliciting the uh, members of the impacted community for scientific ideas, <laughs> that's fine. That's checking the box. I think. This movement needs to constantly go back to uh, the greatest minds in the country, uh, National Science Academy and Woods Hole and all of the scientific institutions and challenge them with your fear of doing harm to something as big as the Atlantic Ocean. Something that big doesn't fix easily once we break it. Take it from fishermen. We know. So uh, science has to be ever evolving. Thank you. OK, anyone else? Way in the back there. How you doing? Uh, James from Claremont from the Code Investor Farm Foundation. Uh, Chris, this, this is a question for you as well. So from the outside looking in, it seemed um, the Block Island Wind Farm Deepwater Wind <coughs> was a pretty, provided a pretty good model for developers um, in terms of assessing the impacts on fisheries, especially with the collaboration between commercial fishermen using their boats and that. I'm wondering uh, if you could give your perspective on that and opinion and if there's any areas that could have been improved or any sort of lessons learned going forward for other developers to take on? You know, scientific research is an economic opportunity for fishermen. It is. I think at one point in my career, uh, one year I did 20 percent of my revenues were science-related endeavors. Uh, so the more that you can build into your solution, components of the community, you will be better received. You know, we want to be part of a solution. We don't want to be identified as a problem to be overcome. <clears throat> no one wants to be a problem. Everyone wants to be part of a solution. So I think the more that you can, uh, you can build into local, your, your solution, local capacity, it's, uh, it's got a good neighborhood feel to it. And to, to build on that a little bit for the rest of the panel, too, so I think that whole question about lessons learned is a really, really, really good one. So um, for the panel, um, uh, anyone have any thoughts or perspectives on lessons learned, um, advice to definitely other states, communities, organizations, regulators, researchers, whoever? Um, I know that Grover and Aileen talked about cumulative impacts. How does that play into it as well? So if the panel would like to handle that one.
<laughs> so many lessons learned. Um, lots to lots to consider here in terms of a response to that question. I think um, you know just thinking about a lot of the themes that have come up today already, and even in this panel of of collaboration and really getting getting everyone to the table, all the many ocean users out there. I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on on BOEM in this space right now. Um, obviously, BOEM is the is the keeper of the leases and ultimately the decision maker on the permits and the approvals of what's going to happen out there. But and there's a, a huge, I think, um, need for BOEM to do a lot of outreach to to stakeholders a, as a result of that process. And 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 they have, and to varying degrees, for sure. Um, I also think that there is a great example here from Rhode Island with the SAMP and the work that the Commonwealth is doing. Um, and the work that New York is doing um, to, you know, in a complementary way, also create um, a lot of opportunity for a lot of folks to get into the conversation, um, because there's a lot to it, um, as as we all know. And so I think, um, you know, I think that that while you know we may not, the SAMP was a moment in time, um, and a lot of of process has has come since, um, certainly at the federal level, um, but the principles there um, of what of what led to um, what is so far the first and only successful uh, project uh, here in this country um, really can and need to be brought forward um, into the new context. And I think, um, so I think that it's it's on all of us. It's on all the states that are, are looking to see offshore wind be a major part of their mix. It's on you know the federal government that does hold the leases. It's on those of us stakeholders to actually to engage, um, to be a part of the solution and not, and not part of the problem. So I think, um, I think among the lessons learned there is just really um, sometimes folks might sort of falsely think about stakeholder engagement as something that's just going to slow things down. And I think the history tells us that it really, um, what slows things down is not uh, having that opportunity to meaningfully engage the stakeholders that are going to be impacted. Yeah. Anyone else? Chris. Yeah, uh, to the developers again, anytime you can take someone who is initially on day one a detractor <coughs> and you can turn them into a partner, that's a two for one. You know, that's a big, big shift. Uh, other than a fisherman, I, I represent the industry in, in, in quarters and uh, recently at a uh, annual meeting of the Seafood Harvesters of America, I'm the president of that. We took 30 fishermen from around the country, from Alaska to Maine, and we loaded them onto a boat and we went out to the wind farm. And we spoke to them, I spoke to them, about our experience and how it was a good one. But that doesn't mean that the next one's gonna be that good. And that their guarantee of a good outcome was going to be their participation. You know, we had Sandra Whitehouse come down and talk to us about spatial planning. Fishermen, uh, have had a currency shift occur to them over the course of time. First of all, years ago, you needed a boat. Then a few years later, you needed a permit. Then a few years later, the currency changed again to quota. You had to have quota or you weren't going to make it. And now the currency is shifting again. It is to access to traditional and valuable grounds. So the, as president of that group, I felt it was my responsibility to bring them up to speed on what we had done here as I think it serves as a, a, a great example, and hopefully we can export that, the enthusiasm and the outcome to other parts of this country. Okay. Anyone else before we finish up? Oh, go over. I just wanted to add that um, <laughs> <coughs> there's a great deal of focus in federal waters on BOEM, but BOEM doesn't have to be the only player. Um, Rhode Island was very concerned about giving a voice to our fishermen and other user groups, such as the Habitat Advisory Board also, in how that federal project would play out. So we pushed our federal consistency boundaries beyond state waters out to federal waters. The developer is gonna be required to file a consistency certification now with us that gives those same entities the same sort of type of input and role uh, that they would have had within the state process. So I think there's an opportunity for states to learn from that, that it doesn't have to be just BOEM. Uh, the states have an opportunity to, to help their user groups also in, in this process. So. Okay. Anyone else? I guess uh, I'll have one follow-up uh, follow question. So 
So Chris, I know you've talked a lot about the process and especially the initial part, the frightening piece. Um, at what point can the developer get the fishermen involved to try to eliminate or try to lessen that frightening piece? Um, we know that it was successful here, and obviously there's, there's a big plan going forward, but would it have been helpful to come earlier? You know, I, I know you said the 200, and a 200 is a big number. Yeah. You know, so thinking, because we're thinking larger now, how, how do you think that could be improved? And I, I opened this up to Ed, too, as well, so. You, you know, for this industry's money, we wish there was a, uh, <clears throat> a pre-described or prescribed path that every developer had to go down. Uh, and, and their being issued a permit was their signal that they agreed to do it. You know, the last thing you want to do is, is uh, feel like a little dog in a big dog fight, mm -hmm. right? And that's how industry feels when permits are issued before any conversation is had. That is a frightening experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, hopefully before we get to the end of this, before there is full implementation of wind farms throughout our nation's waters, that we get to a productive place of accepting, an, uh, accepting a process before a permit is given. Yeah, yeah, so, um, in, in terms of yeah, there isn't there isn't a template, uh, but I think the closest thing to a template that that makes the most sense is um, is the Block Island process um, and the the process that that we've engaged um, you know since the ocean since the Massachusetts Ocean Plan um, in 2008 2009, um, which brings all the stakeholders to the table and and begins the conversation. Um, I think from a fisheries perspective. Um, the most productive conversations that we've had um, as Deepwater's uh, fisheries representative have been one-on-one -on -one with individual um, fishermen uh, or, or, you know, companies um, where, you know, it's, it's, it's a beer conversation to, to get the ball rolling. Um, and the more informal um, parts of that is where you see the industry start to, you know, become more comfortable um, they start to understand that they're you know that, that it's not just uh, you know that, that their stake in um, the conversation is a real one um, and you know there's 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 going to be a lot of really official meetings that Boehm prescribes or CZM suggests uh, but the where you really move the needle is is on you know the you know sitting down and having a beer and um, not you can be coffee too, um, <laughs> and really just learning about what what are the issues, how can we mitigate them, um, what are the opportunities? You know, if you can get past the issue part, uh, the opportunity conversation is is shortly uh, thereafter. So that's you know, in, in terms of the template, um, you know, I think it's it's what we've seen in um, here in Rhode Island, and. You know, it, it takes a lot of, it, it, it also takes people that um, are seen as, you know, Chris and, you know, my, my, my salary comes from the fishing industry. So it's, I'm not going to turn my back on the fishing industry because I won't have a job. Um, so, you know, people, the, the, the representatives need to have credibility with, mm -hmm. the, with the fishing industry in order to um, really make it work. Uh, but I mean, I think we've we've shown that those conversations can happen mm -hmm. and they can be fruitful, um, and we're excited about the opportunities now instead of dreading them, as as Chris mm -hmm. talked about. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Last chance. Any questions of the audience? Any last ones? All right. Any last thoughts from the panel? Something that you missed, or anything else you want to add? All right. Um, so, on this note, um, can we please give a round of applause to the great panel here? And lunch, uh, we're breaking for an hour? Yes. We're breaking for an hour, and lunch is across the road. Okay, at the Coastal Institute. All right, thank you. I'm Carol Grant. Hi, Carol.